The capitalist architecture of the Western world runs on a long debated and much hated bust and boom cycle. When it's booming, you get a roaring 20s. You get a feel good optimist 90s. When it goes bust, you get the 2008 depression, the COVID pandemic, Black Monday, and the biggest bust we've ever seen, the Great Depression. The hardship of the Great Depression was felt for a long decade from a stock market crash in 1929 until 1939. It would bring immense suffering to populations and shape the United States and the world to come for decades ahead. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine homelessness, domestic violence, alcoholism, and other stomach-churning realities of the Great Depression. While the Wall Street crash of 1929 may have been the catalyst that sparked the Great Depression, the impact on banks was profound. The steepest peak of panic from the Great Depression arrived on December of 1930. The failure of the Bank of United States, private, not government, began a collapse of some 608 American banks. This began an understandable trend of runs on banks. Runs, as they are known, is a one-word term for terrified investors trying to withdraw their money as the financial world appears to be in meltdown. By and large, investors were not successful in withdrawing. The whole financial architecture was vanishing before their eyes. The Great Depression would take down a staggering 9,000 banks. Yeah, 9,000. In a world before deposit insurance existed, this meant around $7 billion of depositors' money vanishing along with them. The great social tragedy, of course, was millions of people lost life savings and almost overnight found themselves with nothing. The overwhelming impact of the Great Depression was the effect on the workforce. At its worst, the economic downturn left over 12 million people out of work in the United States. This meant an incredible 25% of the entire country's workforce being out of commission. While the Great Depression was born in the United States and is often the historical focus, the corrosive effects of the Great Depression were felt worldwide. Unemployment would reach as high as 43% in Poland, around 30% in Australia and Canada, and the industrial north of Britain was exceptionally hard hit. When shipbuilding was near collapse from the Depression, northern British cities and towns had unemployment reach as high as 70%. The provincial fallout was millions of people all over the world with no work and left in the void to make ends meet. Resulting of this, families across the world went hungry and had no choice but to rely on charity to survive. What's worse than a Great Depression? When an environmental disaster shows up during the Great Depression. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Dust Bowl. In truth, these events were only linked in the time frame. They didn't hold an intrinsic effect on one another, but remarkably, they went down at the same time. The making of the Dust Bowl was a series of severe dust storms that ravaged prairies and agricultural land across Canada and North America. A toxic cocktail of severe drought and lack of dryland farming techniques rendered swathes of land unworkable. Incredibly, the drought would arrive across three waves in 1934, 1936, and 1939 through 1940. Make no mistake, areas in the High Plains, the western and midwestern regions of the states, would face drought for years ahead, leaving thousands of families adrift in poverty. The Dust Bowl caused a huge migration of people all across the country. Okies, Arkies, and Taxis traveled across the country to find work. Yet this was in the midst of the Great Depression. While more people migrated to California than those who did during the 1849 gold rush, they were arriving to find a place in barely better economic condition than the Dust Bowl they'd fled from. Beyond unemployment, the greatest social tragedy was the loss of homes thanks to the Great Depression. The collapsed monetary supply meant homeowners inevitably would fall behind on their mortgage payments and, as a result, the banks would foreclose on them. This critical consequence meant that come 1932, over a quarter million of Americans lost their homes. Just the next year, approximately 1,000 mortgages were being foreclosed per day. The year 1933 was a horrible milestone for the housing market. Around 40 to 50% of all U.S. homes' mortgages were in default. For the general public, the painful reality was they were left 
homeless, and desperate in a landscape that would take years to resolve. When banks fail, foreclosures skyrocket and life savings vanish. Homelessness inevitably rises. A phenomenon that came to light during the Great Depression was the rise of Hoovervilles. Named after President Herbert Hoover, not a compliment, mind you, Hoovervilles were shantytowns constructed by the homeless during the Depression. These shantytowns were found in the U.S. before the Great Depression. Many large cities had lodging houses for the homeless, but the Depression sent demand through the roof. Makeshift communities of the unemployed built their own residences. If the community was lucky, they had unemployed construction workers who could build with stone. If they were not, which was often the case, people built with wood, cardboard, crates, and scrap metal. Dwellers of Hoovervilles were reliant on begging and charity to survive, and were populated by men, women, and children, entire families. Hundreds of Hoovervilles popped up all around the United States, and would not be deconstructed till the economic recovery across the 1940s. Before the Great Depression, women had been entering the workplace in even greater numbers. The 19th Amendment passed in 1920, granting women the right to vote and, consequently, there was a shift in women's roles. Come the arrival of the Depression at the end of the decade, there was a major shift in men's roles to add to this tide. In fact, while unemployment soured, women's employment actually hit an updraft. From 1930 to 1940, women in work rose from 10.5 million to 13 million. That's 24%. As men were losing jobs by the day, women searched for work more feverishly than ever as the traditional family earner had been lost. This radical change in roles and opportunities had a harrowing effect. Men were often at home taking care of the children, while women went out to work. While this may sound like a logical, healthy swap of gender roles, the result was pretty disastrous. Increases in domestic violence and alcoholism, accompanied by a 22% decline in marriage rates from 1929 to 1939. Evidently, America wasn't quite ready for the change in roles the financial meltdown placed upon it. Making up 25% of the workforce, women across the Great Depression faced a stern test to keep families afloat. Service industries and domestic work were the majority of employment opportunities for women, yet some were steeped in desperation, resorting to sex work to make ends meet. The saving grace that would upend the Great Depression was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. The series of regulations, financial reforms, and public works projects were based on the ethos of the three R's. Reform of the financial system to avoid the same again, recovery of the economy, and relief for the unemployed. As many as six major agencies and programs were started under the New Deal to support the hardest hit, youth, farmers, the elderly, and the masses of unemployed from 1933 to 1939. Despite it bringing much of what the country needed, the New Deal was not without its critics, from any which direction. Conservatives felt the New Deal had simply gone too far into government intervention. Conservative arguments against the New Deal felt it was corrosively socialist in nature. It added to the national debt, overrode states' rights, and brought the presidency closer to a dictatorship. While President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal programs are now seen as key to the country's recovery, they were highly controversial at the time. Some economists and politicians argued that the programs were too expensive and would lead to inflation, while others believed they did not go far enough. Yet amazingly, there were figures on the left of the political spectrum in America that felt the New Deal didn't go far enough. Huey Long advocated a share-the-wealth vision that guaranteed in today's money $112,253.73 a year for each American, mainly achieved by chastened taxing of the richest. If you don't know, Huey Long was assassinated in 1935 before a White House run himself. Hmm. Figures like Father Charles Coughlin, a renowned anti-Semite, argued for a living wage on his radio broadcast. Dr. Francis Townsend demanded, in today's money, $4,500 a month for the unemployed over 60. Goes to show, save a country or not, you'll always have your critics. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.